question because if you, some of you I'm gonna have to talk to you later. <laughs> okay. I'm also excited my parents here so I can lecture to them for once and explain to them how I should have been able to smoke marijuana on principle when I was a teenager and possibly secede from the United States. But we'll get to that in a second. My topic today is the primitivism of politics. This is sort of my version of libertarianism. Uh, I am against politics. I am against partisanship. I am against politics. I think it makes us worse. It's just, it's not too different. I like to call it communitarian libertarianism sometimes, just to put a stick in the side of communitarians. But one way you can think about what I'm going to say today is in the context of the Elizabeth Warren and Barack Obama comments about you didn't build that, or we're all in this together type of attitude. <clears throat> My assertion is we are all in this together. I didn't build that alone. And therefore, libertarianism is what we need. Politics undermines community, it destroys it, and it turns it into a fundamentally primitive endeavor. Point here is to think about politics realistically on the ground and see that it causes us to hate each other and fight over things for no good reason. So that's why I think this is communitarian libertarianism as it goes. So that's the general overview, and we also have another one. Big Romney has released a statement on the departure of Newt Gingrich from the campaign. He reads in part, Anne and I are proud to call him a Newt and Callista friends. We look forward to working with them in the months and years ahead. That for Mitt Romney. Politics is weird and creepy. <laughs> and now I know lacks even the loosest attachment to anything like reality. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. Uh, thank you, Shep, for a moment of lucidity. <clears throat> but we can go a little bit deeper than that. I have some objectives today. So we're going to think about politics differently. This is just a way to talk to people who advocate the other side of libertarianism, however you want to call it. We're going to think about it as a way of choosing alternatives, like outcomes. Different outcomes can chosen in different ways. But it's just a different method for choosing outcomes, right? And because it's a different method for choosing outcomes, it prefers certain traits over other traits. The traits that help you win politics are different than the traits that help you win in the market. So sometimes when we analyze these things, we say, well, people are going to get this, these people are going to get this if we use politics because they have these traits. And if we use the market, we say, well, these other people are going to get this because they have these traits. It's just a different method of distribution. Similarly, the market is the same thing, as I just said. Because of that, I think this is very important. I think that there is something called the perception of participation in different systems. If you go down to the Occupy Wall Street people and you say, hey man, like, we're, we are the market. They're gonna say, no, we're not the market. The market is them. The market is Wall Street executives and people who you know, I have no familiarity with. I don't participate in that. I don't have a meaningful participation in the market. And one of the things libertarians think is that the opposite of that, they say, the Occupy people are going to say, we are the state. And the Virginia's like, no, we're not the state. That's them. That's the other. I have a vote, which is a very bad way of participating in this election. It only gives me the illusion of participation in this thing called the state. So sometimes it's just a question of who is us? Who are we in this situation? <clears throat> so what do I mean by politics? Well, we can start out here. This is a man named Mohammed Bouazizi. Mohammed Bouazizi's life was politicized. He was a merchant on the streets of Tunis, Tunisia, who had constantly fought government regulators for the right to just simply sell his wares. He was constantly being harassed for minute violations, and this of course happens here. Uh, it was, you know, his car was too far from the curb, or he was selling this, or he wasn't registered. And after getting harassed for one last time where a government regulator according to him slapped him and took everything away and literally impoverished him to the point that he wouldn't be able to earn a living, he set himself on fire. Some people have called him the person who generated the Arab Spring. And unconfirmed reports say that over the course of the next few months, about 26 people set themselves on fire throughout the Arab world, protesting pretty much their inability to earn a living because their life had been politicized. We're going to ask why that is okay. This is the woman who slapped him, according. This is the government regulator. These aren't bad people. 
They're doing what they can to apply the rules as they see them. We should never ever insult them for being bad people, at least rhetorically. They're doing the best they can within the framework that they're operating within. And she was very, very upset about what happened, obviously. Other examples of politics, these are Greeks who are bearing gifts. That's how you play politics in Greece now. <laughs> this is how you get things. This is why, one of the reasons why politics is primitivism. Again, the thing we're thinking about here is what are the traits of these people in the political apparatus of Greece that will let them win? What do they have to do to win? Well, they have to form a tribe and start throwing things. Because that's the kind of world that they live in. This is the man who told them to do that, the Prime Minister of Greece up until 2010, whose campaign slogan is, there is money for me to give to you. That's the implicit policy. So this is why they started throwing things. Other politics, this is how you get education in England. They have to make good signs, and if they have organized right, they might be able to get education, or they might not. We'll see, but they're fighting over it like tribes, which is sort of the ultimate point. And maybe this is the ultimate apotheosis of politics, and there's North Korea, where the only way you can get anything done, ever, at any time, is to have certain traits favored by the state. Connections, personal connections, the ability to uh, bribe people. I mean, I don't, I've never lived in North Korea, so I don't know what it takes to get by there, but I'm sure it's horrendous. We've heard about it in many other situations. So, I have some theses. The more areas of life for political decision-making controls, the more the succeeding in life that is getting what you want out of the world depends on if you're really black politically rather than humanly through the market or otherwise, I just said. But what results is a status-based society. Because it's a status-based society, it's in some way fundamentally primitive in a way that we got away from and we're going back to. And because it is a status society and it's not being applied, law is not being applied, but different relations are being applied, who you know is being applied, it undermines the state. So if the state has any justification whatsoever, um, which it may not, but we can talk about that later, it at least has to apply rules equally to different people who are similarly situated. And finally, I will talk about how the Constitution was partially constructed to avoid these problems of over-politicization, and we got away from it. I don't know if anyone can read the bottom um, that's what it's partially constructed to avoid these problems, but it has largely been ignored. So, what do I mean by politics? Well, I don't understand why we have to build a ray gun to aim at a planet I've never even heard of. Don't blame me, I voted for Kodo. No! Anyone who's never seen that sentence is probably the best book of satire written. It's called Citizen Kane, you can find it online. It's about voting over two monsters, aliens, but it's a two-party system, so what are they gonna do about it? It's pretty great. Um, so we just recently had a Kang and Kodos election. Uh, the politics of America told you that it was an apocalyptic fight over the future of the American soul, which is bullshit. <laughs> that is not true. The difference between a 44% marginal tax rate and a 36% marginal tax rate is not a difference in principle. It's a difference on the margin. So we're going to talk about what happens to get this solve this problem. But first, the, the status thing is important now, and I did this in law schools. I like to talk about this famous quote. Now, this is pretty 19th century legal prose, but the only really important part is the bolded part, because there's a legal historian named Henry Sumner Maine who observed that the only way that you got from primitivism to a rule, a, a non-status-based society is to instill contract. What he means by that is that in a primitive society, it's who you know, who your family relations are, for you to be able to trust them. And that means that your gains from trade are very limited. You can deal with people you know, people you think will, will hold up their end of the bargain. But in contract, it's just person A and person B. And anyone can get into that, and that means that your status doesn't matter just as a human being. That's the only real status that matters. So the movement of progressive societies has hitherto been a movement from status to contract. And we're going back to that. So what makes a society primitive? Well, we saw some of these examples, right? Greeks bearing gifts, for example. It is status-based, that status is conferred by various things. Group affiliation was incredibly important in this situation. Personal relationships, do you know the regulator? Do you have inside relations to them? It is goal-oriented. 
oriented by the group. Groups seek one outcome for them as a group, okay? We're talking a lot of examples about this. Um, my favorite one is probably uh, voting about creation versus evolution, right? We manufactured a problem out of thin air that didn't have to exist because we decided to vote about it, and the only way you can possibly get one of those outcomes is to be in the right group and to make your group win. That's because they're zero-sum group fights. If someone wins, the other person loses, which is again why it increasingly resembles team sports. I was in D.C. for the election. I don't advise doing that next time, where you go to sports bars to watch election results because it's insane, and we are this far away from painting our faces and holding up big rubber hands and going to our team bar, which is kind of what there are team bars, by the way, the Republican bar, the Democrat bar. And they all walk down the street like the sharks and the jets ready to fight. So, and we also have codependency. That's another element of group affiliation. You can't get stuff done on your own. Or maybe even if you can sometimes, I'll talk about some of these things, you need a lawyer. And you need the, you need the ability to get carve out your little exemption as a lawyer. So places like, so later in the day, Bob McNamara from Institute for Justice is going to be speaking. And they're an institution that plays the codependency role to allow people to sue the government. But you can't really do that on your own. But they're suing the government so people can live their lives the way they want to live them. You get gifts from the chief in a, in a primitive society. Whether he's the chief executive, there are dispensations, exemptions, and waivers, and that happens all the time. Talk to a lawyer, it'll drive you crazy. <clears throat> so, but we have another possibility. We could have a law governed state, not politically governed state. And we've been writing about this for eons. What is the point of a law governed state? We have to have common rules applied commonly to people to achieve the common end, not specific rules to tied to specific groups of people to achieve their specific end. So we have here Aristotle, rightly constituted the law should the final sovereign, the personal rule, whether it be exercised by a single person or a body of persons, should be sovereign only in those areas where you can frame general rules for all contingencies. Otherwise, you shouldn't be using law. Families don't use law. They can, my parents can treat me and my brother totally differently, and they did. <laughs> and I won that battle, by the way. <laughs> there no, there's no obligation for them to treat us the same. They, but the state has that obligation. Again, Aquinas. A law has an end, an author, its form. So I listen to my parents, the author of my parents, and the form would be telling me things I couldn't do, but they didn't have to apply the common good. Its author does not exceed the powers, its form, its burdens are laid upon the subjects in a due proportion with the common good in view. Think about how much that is not the world we live in. And that is essentially the whole point of this talk. And because that is not the world we live in, we live in a primitive world. In a politically governed state, where you have to have influence, preferred voices, media, the New York Times. I work at Cato. People are generous to give me Cato. I have a preferred voice. <clears throat> Ability. Do you have the ability to deal with all the laws? This is about half the fight in law. One of the reasons that big companies will always choose regulation to regulate their competitors out of business is because they have a cadre of lawyers who keep up with the Code of Federal Regulations, which now the only question is, we've run out of abilities to like create, you know, if you laid it all in the end, it would go from here to this. We're just wondering when it gets to the moon. And I predict that's about 2020. So keeping up with the laws is half the game. There are so many laws that can get you any time. Access, do you have access to lawmakers? Do you have access to regulators? Can you talk to them? Are you a preferred voice? Do you have a trade association in DC? By the way, the best trade association in DC is the Distilled, Distilled Spirits Council, and their holiday parties are awesome. <coughs> and can you get exemptions and waivers? Now, all these laws, can you get exemptions from them because you really, you're not complying with them at all, even you guys. You're running a business, you're violating them all the time. The Bill of Rights is a series of waivers and exemptions. But again, I'm not talking about how that's been largely ignored. And of course, group membership. That's how we have a politically governed state. So, now we're gonna go to my way I think about this. So this is gonna get kind of abstract and nice, but we'll come back to some core things. So what, where is politics not allowed? How do we decide where politics is allowed? What are we gonna vote about, and when are we gonna vote about it? And how do we decide that? There are some places where politics isn't allowed. We have theories that help us figure that out. And the other question is why? That's sort of the whole point of this lecture. Why is politics not allowed in certain situations? So, here is human life. We have redheads. 
this is my team. So Mike, I told you you're on my team. <laughs> <laughs> so redheads, for the redheaded people, they're all the same. And these are just people in general, all people. Have something I call a zone of autonomy. We could call this a right in this situation, but this is going to get a little bit bigger, so we're going to call this a zone of autonomy right now. This means that within that zone, people aren't allowed to politicize it. They can't vote over what you wear, over your haircut, but apparently we can vote about some things, but generally that's the presumption. And there are a lot of people, and one of the ways that we can live together cordially is that we sit around like this and we understand that there's zones of autonomy. Everyone here is not, you know, it's like, you know, encroaching on that zone. It helps us order our life. But, and then we have other people who are the purples. I hate the purples. And they're together, and they have their own zones of autonomy. And so, sometimes we get a bunch of people together, and we draw another zone of autonomy around it. To say, we're all, this could be a gated community, where the homeowners are at. This could be a locality, a municipality, a state. We draw another zone of autonomy. And we, we decide within that what we're going to do about that zone of autonomy. And then we can put a bunch of them together. This is my diagram of the United States of America, the federal republic, and put another zone of autonomy around it. So here we're voting on certain things that happen within it. But there's always this presumption of a zone of autonomy. And the question here is how do you get inside the zone of autonomy? What are the theories that have allowed people to get inside the zone of autonomy and why? And there are generally two. Again, redheads and a zone of autonomy. Now why <coughs> Sorry. do we use this to regulate, for example, drugs? Okay, that pierces the zone of autonomy. Well, I think there's two general reasons. One of them is that the effects leak outside the zone, right? The effects of this don't, aren't contained entirely in the zone. And so presumptively, we can get this beforehand. So if someone could show me that bath salts made you eat a face every time you ate it, then that would be a very good presumption that the effects are going to leak outside the zone. But there are many, I mean, drugs, we're talking about drugs, you know, sometimes the effects are, are that people aren't going to be good citizens, or they're going to sit in their basement and play Halo all day. Um, and that's a, that leaks outside the zone because they're not, you know, being a good citizen. A very bad argument. And of course, the other one is that it's just evil. That's another way we can get inside the zone. This is just wrong. People should not be allowed to do this. So we have these two situations, and they aren't confined. This is why I call it a zone of autonomy. They aren't confined to just the individual. You have your property the same way. How are you going to decorate your house? That's not politicized. But if someone can tell a story about how your house decorations leak outside the zone, then they could. Or how about this one, light bulbs. How do we get to light bulbs? Well, we have this theory, right? Your light bulbs are politicized because there is a theory that it leaks outside the zone. And of course, there's a little bit of the skull and crossbones there, too. There's a little bit of it's evil in some way. So, as I said, drugs is a very good example of this, but almost everything. Here's another one of my favorites, the family guy. We'll get to what that means by that. That's another thing that we regulate based on this theory. <clears throat> so, we can call these two types of ways of interfering in the zone of autonomy. One of them is effects driven. These are the arrows outside of the zone. And communitarianism relies on this idea. Modern leftism loves it. You're never alone. Again, like I said, you're all in the community. So because of that, we're going to pretend there are no zones because everyone affects everyone. And I'll get to why Obamacare is like that. The other one is ethics driven. Just the it's wrong. That's how we politicize the zone. That's how we politicize when you can play on your TV. That's how we politicize when you're allowed to feed, put into your body. Conservatism definitely does that, but also modern leftism. Michael Sandel, who's a famous communitarian philosopher, he wrote a book describing everything he hates the people buy. It's a horrible book. He hates HOV lanes, he hates boxes and stadiums, he hates, he just hates so many things that he doesn't realize that he and Rick Santorum would really get along if they went fishing. They could just talk about how, yeah, man, don't you, you know, don't you hate it when they, like, corporations, he hates corporations, like, you know, these people get together, but, you know, can't they just do it in private? Or why do they have to let, let everyone else, you know, get, get a wind of it? So, these are the two types of ways we're thinking about it. But again, why do we need zones of autonomy? Well, part of it is to get away from this, because otherwise, all life is politicized. So I discussed why we need it at the beginning. Obamacare. <laughs> Who knows the theory of why they said that they could make you buy health insurance? And which one of those was it describing? 
Anyone? They said it was a tax, essentially. That's what the Supreme Court said. Okay. But why were they giving an individual mandate originally? Why do they say that you get inside your zone? Um, we live in a society in which someone without health care under emergency situations uh, will still be cared for by our public hospital, mm -hmm. and thus the uh, cost of someone without health insurance is burdened by all of those who do the test. So which theory is that of the two I said? Uh, that is a, the first theory. The effects driven. It leaks outside the zone. The effects of you not having health insurance leak outside the boat. So, now the main thing that we said at Cato Institute, and I worked on that case extensively, was duh. And what basically we said <laughs> duh, because everything you do and don't do has an effect on everyone else. And again, this is the main drive we have for communitarianism. Um, that's why they think we can make a community out of this and start voting on everything. That's one example. Another one, New York City Big Soda Bay. <laughs> wow. I think this one is a little bit of both. There's the effects driven on health care, which this is a very important point. One of the things about the liberal state, the modern, not the classic liberal state, the modern progressive state, is that as you take over health care, you start to have very good arguments for how this stuff leaks outside the zone, right? I give smoking about 30 years before it's banned on that exact same theory, maybe less, you know. I was watching Blade Runner the other day and I thought, wow, it's really quaint that they thought you could smoke in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, uh, the big soda band has a colorful explanation of the state is taking over healthcare because they made us communitarian by doing that. They made our effects bleed into each other. But here's the important point. When you saw conservatives saying, well, that's stupid, you can't do that. They're, they want to ban marijuana or heroin or whatever. There's no principled stance that they can take against the New York City Big Soda Bank. That's one reason why we need zones of autonomy. Because otherwise you're just arguing about facts. And if you paid attention to the world in the last five years, people don't really pay attention to facts. <laughs> so, we need to have zones of autonomy so libertarians come in and say, no, both you on the left and you on the right are crazy. You can't do this. Another, I also think that the evil thing comes into place here. I think that they, they also think that consumerism is evil. That's the moralism of the modern left, right? There's no reason anyone should ever have to have that big of soda. Here's another example. Here's how they politicize your house. The FCC, my favorite organization. Um, so the FCC regulates broadcast spectrum antenna reception. The first question I want to ask is, does anyone not know that you can get TV with an antenna? Because I've been talking to people in the early 20s and like my roommate had this problem. She didn't know that you could like put something on your TV and capture the TV that's in the air. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> and one of the reasons they do that is because they, they said in the Supreme Court case that the, that spectrum leaks into the zone, right? We can't, we can't keep it outside the house, so some kid might go in and turn on something and hear some swear words and become an ax murderer. Again, that's effects driven, right? So the FCC has this mandate to issue licensure for broadcasters who, in the public interest, convenience, and necessity, try and drive a truck through that, or at least three, in terms of how much discretion they have to decide if you're doing it okay. And they can threaten to take away your broadcast license. And because of that, as I said, there's a lower First Amendment protection for over-the-air television than cable television, because of this theory of it permeating the zone. So the FCC still does this, and this is how they do it. There's an organization called the Paris Television Council, and in this situation we can think of them as the Greeks. Okay? They are organized, they have a tribe, and they are fighting against what you can watch on TV and you probably don't even know it. Because they have a website where they send out action alerts to parents who are concerned about some television show that they hate. And then you can go and just send FCC complaints over and over again. Okay? So, to give you an example, Right after the Parents Television Council started, they had this website, using their tribal influence to primitively fight over what you watch on television. This was about what they had in 2003. 242 total complaints for the entire FCC about all broadcasting all over the place. And then the ultimate evil occurs. The family guy, who they hate so much, it's unbelievable. And so an episode of Family Guy airs, and they sit out an action notice, and the next month they get 5,522 complaints. Now, why are they mad about this? Well, again, they have probably both theories. They think the ethics theory, that it's just evil to watch shows about horse semen, 
And then they also have the effects theory. They think it turns you into a bad person. Okay? The other point here is that based on that, you know, if someone else takes over the FCC, they're just fighting over this based on, you know, I think people should be watching this, or I think people should be watching this. Your games are only as good as your political, as your political ability. My favorite one is the, this one, the 922 bits, and then literally there was some family guy that said about horse semen, that's all I was able to figure out. And that's how many complaints they got, 120,000. This is the tribe, and they fight better than you do. Because you guys aren't organized to protect your ability to watch what you want to watch. And there's a political person who says, well that's what you've got to do. Make an interest group, get organized, lobby so you can watch the family guy. No. No. That is the libertarian stance. No. If I do that, my ability to watch The Family Guy is only as good as my ability to win the next election. It's only as good as my ability to fight politically. It's only as good as my ability to have those traits that I talked about to win in the political sphere. So it wasn't supposed to be this way, right? We can think about zones of autonomy and zones of power. So we had Congress who had very limited powers in the Constitution. And it would be very easy for you to avoid what they do. You could stay out of the way of commerce. You could not do commerce. And you could stay out of the way of commerce's authority. That was part of the original conception, that you could actually live your life ignoring the federal government. Amazingly enough, that's what they thought. And you know, it would be fine, you know, they wouldn't be able to you know, take you to your house because your house was outside the realm. There was no way that you got in Congress's way. But of course, this is not how it is anymore. That, that's not the way. And it looks a lot more like that. And all these things are going away. There are no more property rights really in this situation. Your autonomy has gone away. And now we have this little red-headed people who are trying to figure out how to live their life. And suddenly they're charged with the task of fighting over it primitively, fighting over it politically. And then there's this person, poor Blue. Poor Blue doesn't have a track. Doesn't even know this is going on. That's the real loser in this situation. And if you over politicize society, that we all become blues on some level. And we'll talk about some of these blues. There's so many examples of them you can stop talking about. But it's even worse than that, right? I wasn't gonna drop 50 nets, but imagine that 50 states. Regulatory apparatus, and there's a mega net, which I tried to put in, but it just clouded everything, over the whole thing, that's a federal government. And we have reds all over the place, and they can organize. You know, they can get together and say, hey, all the Reds, we're gonna have to organize against the federal government. Good example is Catholics and the birth control mandate, which I'll talk about in a second. And then there's the poor blues. There's one over there, there's one over there. They are trying to figure out how to fight politically. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's a great example. Act up. So the FDA is another thing that politicizes your life and decides what you can take into your body. So in the 1980s, when AIDS was sweeping through the gay community and literally sapping them dry, and no one knew what was really going on, there were all these experimental drugs. And the FDA was still saying, no, we have, we have a hammer and well, everything was like a nail. If we're gonna run these drugs to the same trial. So they told these dying gay men that some of them had to be given placebo sugar pills and not be given the real drug because the FDA was taking care of them. And they got very upset. And they got their tribe together, and they went down to Washington to the FDA building, and they actually shut it down for a second. And then the FDA went back into a rulemaking and decided, okay, we will let gay men with AIDS have access to these drugs before the experimental trial. So they won that tribal fight because they got their reds together. So here's a blue. This is a girl named Abigail Burroughs who died in 2001 of head and neck cancer. There was a very strong possibility that a drug that the FDA had approved only for colon cancer could have helped her, but they wouldn't let their, her get that drug. She sued the DC District Court saying that they were violating a fundamental right of hers to have the, uh, access to life-saving medicine. She lost because the DC Circuit Court said, well, that would change how the FDA does things too much. So she died, because she's a blue. So, some people say, well, no, it's, it could be better. You know, we get better regulators, better voting, all get together. You know, all these effects leak out, let's just imagine, we don't need that. 
get together, we'll talk about our issues, we'll, we'll make sure everyone's voice is heard, you know, we, we, can, we can live communally, we all sing Kumbaya together, you know, and, and, and it'll be nice. And we'll let the blues in too. They can get in that camel too. We'll, let, we'll hear what the blues have to say. And we'll say, oh, okay, well, that's, a, you know, that's how we deal with the blues. But of course, how do they deal with the blues? Well, they like to itemize you, right? So affirmative action is a really good choice example. Like, you are an Asian. Well, you know, and all Asians are the same. <laughs> Malaysian, you know, J Japanese, Korean. You know, we'll itemize you as an Asian. There's blues. We got blues in there. We got Asians. Good job. That's how they do it. It's like, no, it's not like this. It's not like this at all. If we just had better communication, better politics, better, more people honestly listen to the facts, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like this at all. It would be like this, and we could all live hunky-dory, and if we're all just not fighting about it, and we would all have a happy time, and the blues would come, and the purples, and the greens, they would all... No. <laughs> Why? Well, go back. You're fighting over zero-sum games. They do this entire thing for the FDA to take care of all of us, but they can't take care of all of us equally. And their victories are your losses. How can you do that with public schools? How could you possibly do this vision with public schools? When you say there has to be one size fits all education, we'll let the blues in, but they don't let the blues in. It's impossible. It's too important to people for them to do it this way. You wanna know why politics gets worse and worse? Because it matters more and more. There's this whole thing about why are we so political now? Why are we fighting at each other? There was a golden age where everyone got along and spoke. That's crap, first of all. That's not true at all. But you hear this in DC, and then now they're blaming on Republicans. There's a whole book that came out about Republicans being inability to talk to people. But it's mattering too much now to do anything else. This is not ever going to happen. It's going to be this. Another example, I don't have waivers, you're fighting over gifts from the chief, right? So another good example, I talked about all the laws. Um, any lawyers in here, which I know there's at least two, uh, well, and a half, <laughs> um, just pick your act, pick your regulation. Ro they'll roll you up in red tape if they want to, because they can about anything. And then they'll say, well, we can make it all go away. You just have to do something for us. So then your ability to do something for them is your, is your permitted trait. Dodd-Frank, I don't even want to talk about that. It's probably the worst law in the past. Me, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so bad, it's going to destroy a lot. And, and we're still trying to figure out what's in it, but the same thing's going to happen. The firms that can keep up with the laws and deal with the regulators are the ones who can win. And the firms that can't are the ones that are going to lose. And at Affordable Care Act, that's Obamacare. That's just going to be primitivism forever going forward. How are we going to define our national health care plan? Get ready to fight about that and organize your tribe. Right after 1927, this was just a bunch of giveaways from Herbert Hoover, who was the Secretary of Communications at the time, uh, giveaways to give licenses to all these people. And then one of my favorite ones, we have a Supreme Court case we're trying to bring right now about this. Localities do this all the time. We'll roll you up in red tape. Make sure you can't get what you want, can't build your property, and maybe we'll make it go away, but you have to build a public park. So now your only made it way to build, build on your property is to be able to build a public park for someone else. Very hard to legally fight it, because we're trying to bring one right now. As I said, this is one of the best examples we've heard recently. We're trying to find our national health care plan. And what do the Catholics think about that? Well, that's crap. What will they think about it when they start bringing up abortion? It's a mandatorily funded thing. One of the reasons that they hated the idea of religious, a state religion in the, in the colonial days was not because they, many of them wanted to be able to take over that state religion. I mean, like, they were very religious people. John Adams is a good example. He might be in favor of state religion if he could be the winner of that game. But after 200 years of fighting in Europe and a 30 years war, which was unbelievably insane, they realized that if you actually try and make everyone have the same religion, you're just going to end up killing each other. Ultimately primitive. So the Catholics, though, they're lucky. They're Reds, they got some Reds together. And they have a First Amendment, so they have a waiver in there. They're Catholics, but they have political power. They have people that go on television, people who can make a fuss, and spokesmen. 
What about Hindus, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientologists, Ayurvedic Medicine, or just someone who in principle is against this? What about them? They're not going to get out of this birth control mandate or any other mandates going forward about what our national health care looks like. But you really think about it, it's so important to us. It is like saying it's our national religion. One of my favorite ones, de enrolling legal immigrants. So Romney Care, you know, which is the model for Obamacare, was having a huge problem with the budget shortfalls. So they signed an executive waiver to exempt about 40,000 legal immigrants from the Romney Care program. But think about this with the rhetoric. We're going to cover everyone in Massachusetts. Oh no, not you guys. And, like, and why didn't they, why was it legal immigrants? Because they couldn't vote. So they used, the, they, they didn't have one of those political traits. They did have, a, they were able to sue. And again, it's so codependent. They won that suit. But is that still how you have to figure out how to fight for your health care? And again, is that a right to health care? When the government can just decide that 40,000 people suddenly don't have health care, is that what a right to health care is? And this we get to the very important point about the primitivism of positive rights. Because it could get, and it likely will get, even worse. And what I mean by that is the distinction between positive rights and negative rights. And this is very important. If there's one thing you learn from this, uh, I would definitely say that this is probably it. A right has a two-place relationship. There's a right holder, and there's a duty holder. So right now, I am enjoying the right to life, which means all of you guys have the duty to not kill me. And thank you very much for not doing that right now. And in, infinite people cannot kill me. We can add a billion more people to those society, and they just all have to not kill me, and we're still doing hunky-dory on the right to life. You can omit an infinite number of things, because that's the opposite side of what's called a negative right. A negative right means that the other person only has to omit, okay? A positive right means that the person has to act. And because there's only so many actions you can undertake, it becomes a fight of a different sort. So if I have a right to health care, that means your guys' obligation is to give me health care, right? So now that's a positive right. So we talk about we're going to get a positive rights in the Constitution. Well, ultimately that becomes really bad. The guy who came up with this as well as Newton Hofeld, you can look that up. Very important. Let me be very clear. Again, positive rights are merely claims to resource allocations. They are not production of more resources. Right? Or even clearer, three ice cream cones plus four free ice cream cone waivers equals that. That's what you get from claims to positive rights. We'll give everyone a waiver for ice cream cones but we'll do nothing to produce more ice cream cones. And so we're going to have that to decide if we get ice cream cones. Political fights that are primitive. So how is the Constitution supposed to solve this? Well, the best way of putting this is that the Constitution was meant to be a system where there was a sea of liberty with islands of power. And what we have is a sea of power with islands of liberty. And trying to define those liberty parts is what we're fighting over primitively. So, to expand on that, it's a surprising fact that five days before the end of the convention, the proposal for a Bill of Rights was unanimously voted down. And it was like, well, the Bill of Rights is the most important single part of the Constitution. No, it's not. Making the Bill of Rights the most important Constitution, part of the Constitution, is how you get here. They didn't want a Bill of Rights because they thought that you don't define liberty by explaining the things you have freedoms to. You create liberty by explaining power. Power is the problem, not liberty. You give power and liberty is presumed. If you start listing the things you have liberty to, everything that you don't list will seem to be not very important, right? So, first thing, if you kept the government within those powers, then you wouldn't really need rights because they wouldn't be allowed to trample them. And again, they knew this about listing the rights. They weren't going to say you have a right to wake up on time, you have a right to wear a hat or not, you have a right to all these things, because that would be incomplete. There's liberty is too big to try and list. And so they put in the Ninth Amendment, which says the, the rights of in this Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage rights retained by the people, which merely means because we listed some rights, it doesn't mean that's all the rights you have. Okay? And because of that, we've created something different. We've created a hierarchy of rights. 
And this is exactly what they were afraid of. We now have a system in constitutional law where you have preferred rights to the ones that were listed, and the ones that aren't listed are not preferred, which is exactly what they wanted to get away from. And then coincidentally enough, things like the First Amendment right to free speech, the kind of rights that are preferred are coincidentally the kind of rights that liberal law professors really care about. It is not the right to earn a living. It is not the right of Muhammad Bouazizi to go and start a business and not be harassed to the point that he sets himself on fire. Liberal law professors don't care about that. They've never started a business. They don't really care about that. They want to be able to speak and vote and all those things. So we've inverted the Constitution in that exact same way I said it. We have a sea of power of islands of liberty. And those islands of liberty are ranked. And who ranks them? Not you guys. They're ranked already. So, the best way of explaining this is a really good quote by James Wilson, which is worth pondering. This was said at the ratifying convention in Pennsylvania. This is why it's more important to limit power than to explain freedom. Because one of them is if failing at one task is worse than the other. So, if we attempt an enumeration of rights, everything that's not enumerated is presumed to be given. Because the very fact that you try to list, they presume that. The consequences is that an imperfect enumeration of rights would throw all implied power into the scale of government, and the rights of the people would be rendered incomplete because you didn't list all the rights. On the other hand, an imperfect enumeration of powers, if you're just trying to explain the powers of government, that reserves the implied power to the people, to the sphere of liberty. And, and by that it means the Constitution might be incomplete because it didn't list powers well enough, but of the two, it is much safer to run the risk on the side of, of the Constitution. For omitting some powers of government and not giving government enough power is not as dangerous nor important as omitting rights. And that's what he said, and everything he said has come true. Because we didn't list the rights, they're not there, essentially speaking. So, conclusions. Political fights are messy. We talked about many of the reasons why they are. I also think they make us worse people. And there's a book I'm working on with my colleague, his brother, <coughs> called How Politics Makes Us Worse. And his interest is how it actually makes us worse people. It makes us non-virtuous people who fight over stupid things for no good reasons. And by doing that, it invents problems that need not exist. Again, creation versus evolution is not a problem. That is not a problem. There is a continuum of possibilities of what we can teach our children, and choosing just two is insane. And they further create inequality, but that's a different type of inequality. This is political inequality. This is a very important point. Let me reiterate again. We're talking about traits, so if you're analyzing political traits, it's still unequal. It hasn't made it more equal. It's made it differently unequal. We put it this way, again, back to ice cream cones. Let's say that ice cream cones were the only thing that mattered in life, okay? So there are two ways we could distribute ice cream cones. One of them is by standing in lines, and one of them is by paying for them. Now the standing in lines means that people who have time are preferred. That's who's preferred in that distribution. If you have more free time, then you're preferred in the ice cream cone lottery. By putting money on it, it means people have money are preferred. But only the money one is the one that produces more ice cream cones. And if you want to produce more ice cream cones because they're important, you've got to choose the money, not the time one or any other thing of distributing ice cream cones. These are the characteristics of politics that make it primitive. There is zero sum. We're fighting over gains. Do other people are losing? Do you have sufficient interest? Do you have access? Can you comply? Or do you have waivers? It perverts our constitutional structure. It is beyond repair at this point. We're just fighting over small little things all the time. And the final thing I want you to think about is whether or not this is a bug or a feature of politics. Is this, is this a perversion of it, or is this how it's supposed to work? Would a political regulator want to deal with fewer groups and not have to deal with the multifarious people and individuals making claims on them? So he says, come back and get a trade organization, then I'll talk to you. Isn't that a feature of it for his job? Primitivization of politics? Which is... Exactly the point. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Questions? Oh, come on. No one?
This is a law school class right of mine, by the way. We used to fight about this in class. We had many great debates. What would be what would be your your uh, theory as to be the best way? So since since politics are are primitive, and I would agree with that thesis, what what would be the best way? Would you say to try and get something that is something like a healthcare um, to all the people? How would you go about doing that? Oh, it's, I mean, it's very, I mean, that's a fairly simple question. Um, you need to choose the money ice cream cones part so more health care is produced. And you, need to let, and you need to let that happen so you get, because your health care is so important, you have to lose the money. And then if there are people at the end of the day, and which of course everyone should know this, we haven't done that, right? If, ever, if no one has a, a canned response to Obamacare discussion where we say, um, well, we tried the free market and that didn't work. That is such a load, it's unbelievable. Have you ever shopped for anything in healthcare in your life? Do you have any idea what anything costs whatsoever? And that's a free market? We haven't tried that in 50 years. I would be, I would be willing to concede that if we use the free market to make healthcare cheaper and increase its access, at the end of the day, then what we do is we use like, something like food stamps which does not fundamentally pervert the market if you use it at that level. It's not a takeover of healthcare to try and distribute these things politically. Like I prefer programs like that if you're, if you're talking about marginal gains. So that's, a, that's one example. Um, at the end of the day, is there gonna be someone who doesn't have healthcare? Yes, that will happen in the political realm and that will happen in the market realm. But the, the gains of the market on the other levels are much, much better. You mentioned that sort of one of the reasons that people make an argument for restricting access to things like drugs that might potentially make users sort of worse citizens. You know, that's sort of the main argument that people bring against um, freeing use of such substances and other similar liberties. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, so this is sort of the inverse of the realms of autonomy model that you could look at it as Within a realm of autonomy that includes multiple people, to what extent does they have an interest body in there have a responsibility or the other legitimately to shape sort of the society there? I think the justification of how much politicization an uh, area is allowed to have is tied to the way in which people arrive there. Okay, like whatever the justification of government is, at the lowest level, social contractarian, all that stuff like that, it only gives them, if, if I'm born in this government, it only gives them very limited power. But if I move into a place, like a gated community, where they're gonna regulate your house color, right? And you're choosing to fight over that politically. So you can look at the sort of scope of possible powers of governing structures, which are not necessarily governments, but governing structures, is being related to how you entered in to that system and whether or not, so I think that the, insofar as any government is justified, it would be something like social contractarianism, although I'm still not sure about that. And Mike Humer, who is gonna be talking later today, but I don't think about that, uh, has a book coming out on the problem of political authority, which is about why there probably maybe is no justified political authority. But whatever it is there, it's very limited. It's not, so, the, so that's the first question. It's sort of, a, it's a political philosophy question, right? But the system that I would like to live in, because I think people should be allowed to run you know, close-knit communities where they have more, more communal voting over more things, but then people can be. And this is a basic problem in libertarianism, right? There are two general answers we have. There is, and this is true about other political rights, there is the problem that we want there to be a floor. Like, we want, politi we want all political life to have a floor below which it won't, it won't go. And that floor is like the rights of the people, right? So the, there's no slavery, that's a floor. That, the Civil War was about establishing a floor of no slavery throughout the entire country, okay? So we want that to be a floor, okay? But, so that's one way of trying to preserve liberties is trying to enact a floor. Usually we enact floors though with bigger government structures. So like the UN Charter on Human Rights is like an attempt to enact a floor, right? I mean, it's, it has, it's impotent, but an attempt to enact, enact a floor. Uh, that's one way you can say we need this summer to pursue the values of liberties we need, is to get government interested in enforcing the floor. 
Or you can be so skeptical about government like I am that the really only real solution is radical um, diversification with a right of exit. Like ultimately speaking, small townships that you can leave um, are better at protecting liberties than relying on government to protect liberties. And that one says there may be a community without a floor. So that in that one you're conceding that one of these communities may be a systematic rights violation. Um, but the overall system may be better. But those are kind of the two choices you have. Enforce the floor either through top-down government control or enforce the floor by people being allowed to leave as much as they want. Talk about, I mean, I guess my question is, you know, you want to bring about these changes, are you suggesting that we don't participate in this tribal forming and coalition groups and things? The ultimate question. And if so, what would you it's a session. No, um, <laughs> I do think that um, I don't vote for a variety of reasons. But one reason I don't vote is because I think that you can't solve politics by voting. Because the theory here is we're not going to vote about this. And some of that we all know. Like the proper response to your entire neighborhood and getting together and voting on how you cut your hair tomorrow is not form a group, get action together, get out there, make your voice heard. It's to say, we don't vote on this shit. That is the proper response to that. And that's what I want to believe, but I live in, I don't live in that world exactly. So some things, if they were, if it was possible for my vote to change things in little limited ways and we were voting on something and I would just be allowed to vote no, I could do that. But generally, we're over a cliff now. Or because we politicize schools, um, we just, we're now just fighting about how they're going to look and your ability to win that is only as good as the next election, right? So, I mean, it's, it's all marginal gains, which I'm for marginal gains for liberty, and that's what I do at Cato. When I come here to speak, I'm here to be radical and you know, say this is the society we should be fighting for, this is why I fight for it, but I am for marginal gains. So if I can get school choice to occur for 10 years in a state before we lose that political battle the next time because we're fighting over it, but 10 years of kids are gonna get better schooling, I'm for that. Like, and that's why, I, that's why I work at Cato and don't just rant about politics all day and how evil it is. No. How do we break through the being in healthcare, our standards are now evidence-based mm -hmm. that are bought and paid for. So how do we throw the wrecking ball into that so that we do have real freedom of choice? And to do, as a healthcare provider, that I can do what's right for the patient, not by this one-size-fits-all healthcare. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 again, the, the, the answer to that is depoliticization. I mean, like, if you're asking how to get rid of the FDA, well, like, you know, give money to Cato. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, this is what this is about. Yes. It's not going to happen. That this SFL, growing libertarians, making people think this way, or ho hoping people understand what I'm saying, and how your, your, your desire to play this political game is just moderate gains until you lose the next election, so you should just want to get out of it. I mean, that's communicating that. I mean, the answer is, is what we're doing here. I mean, I don't have, you know, Bob's FDA is going to be a major, major, major problem. It probably will never happen. But you got to try. You're going to do what you think is right. Anyone else? Um, I did want to go back to, you said the food stamps on the, uh, the healthcare thing. There's a big difference <coughs> there. The food stamps, you can go into a grocery store with a bunch of food stamps and some cash and supplement that. You can't do that in healthcare. They oh, no. Don't you spend extra money. Well, this is, we're talking about an ideal system I would have in my totally free market system. I mean, the, the thing here is we want, the, we want medicals, medicine in this country to look more like LASIK, okay? LASIK surgery has never been covered by insurance, essentially. Everyone shops for it comparatively. And so, in what, 1998 when it came out, it was outrageously expensive, $15,000 an eye or something like that. Now it's what, 400, 500, we'll throw in the second eye for free, you know, like, like and you hear these, you know, these, these, you know, the kids get for free, we hear these, you know, commercials, like, we need more of that. We need that kind of competition in medicine about everything. Like, and after that, it just gets way cheaper, innovation goes up, and that's where the food stamps come in, in, in my position, to solve, you know, unmet need. Eric? 
I just wanted to, um, you, you just said in, in your um, hypothetical world of uh, complete free market, is now, now you are talking about just healthcare, you're not talking about like, um, well, uh, tropical storm of sandy is, and you know, only private people should help out there. Do you, do you think the government does belong in that? No. <laughs> no. Look into FEMA and Katrina and tell me if you think the government well, belongs Katrina, Katrina, Katrina was different because you had somebody who was running it who didn't care for it. Where in Sandy, you have somebody who's running it who does care for it. Oh, Don't fix politics with the right people, Eric. I told you this all the time. Like, no. this is not the solution. I'm not Michael Brown is not the problem. Fix. What I'm saying is that the, what you said was that FEMA is terrible because of Katrina. And I agree. That was awful. That was, it was, it's the incentive. They're just not there. I agree. But, but, but at least in that circumstance. But you, you compare the same kind of circumstance. Where, okay, so if, if you don't want government in that kind of circumstance, what, how would you fix New Jersey. Uh, well, first of all, I would allow a ton of price gouging. I mean, like that's the like we we need a massive amount of price gouging in New Jersey. There's just no reason that that should be happening. So we we, we don't allow price gouging because it makes us feel bad. But what makes us what should make us feel bad are these people who don't have water and power. Like it's the, the price gouging argument is the exact same thing I said about about ice cream cones, right? The only the only thing that will make you produce more ice cream cones is the price pop gouging. So to get more of that stuff there, you have to have price gouges. That's one example. Um, but let's talk about FEMA for a second. Because it's politicized, it's political, and it runs off of you know, a president's ability to, <laughs> I just think laughing, a president's ability to fight a hurricane, like, which is just, <laughs> like, if you've read my colleague Gene Healy's book about the cult of the presidency, it's, it's, it's great. It's not, it's not our ability to fight but it, natural disasters, it's response. But, his, but his, politi his political life is on the line. So what happened in Katrina, because of that, is they made, they, they've been avoiding uh, type one errors, which is, which is when you create harm from doing something. Um, they create a lot of type two errors, which is when you create harm by not doing something, okay? So they were not letting anyone into the Katrina zone because it was bureaucratized, because they were afraid that people who went in there would get hurt. So there's a really good example, like there's the tale of two sheriffs. There was a sheriff from Indiana, a sheriff from Michigan, who, were, who got, got all these people together, got a ton of water, a ton of volunteers, and they drove down to New Orleans, and the sheriff from Michigan went through FEMA. And he was like, we gotta go through FEMA for the bureaucracy. So they held him at the border because they said that he might get hurt in there. The sheriff from Indiana didn't, and went straight in there. One of the things you expect from politics is that it will make more type one errors than type two errors, because the type one errors are visible. They're politically costly. Costly. So when people die from meningitis and drugs, that's a type one error, that's politically costly. What you don't have are the people who aren't getting the drugs because you can't introduce them to Congress. Like, and that's just a systematic bias in politics, which is another reason we want to depoliticize this. I'll cross the board. Whatever is politically costly is what I want to avoid. Like, and that's not the same as human flourishing. That's not the same as what? It's human flourishing. Adam? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm oh, yeah, sure. That's, and, and that's, that's about it, but also it's, it's not like building your house is not, you're not, you never go, if you have a house fire, most people don't go to the government and ask them for money, they go to their insurance carrier. But when it comes to, okay, well, my street just got upheaval and completely destroyed. People well, the public roads is the problem, the first problem here. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was my favorite joke about Cato. Um, there was this problem where the, this guy comes to a Cato scholar and is like, have you heard about the situation where they're, having, they're selling heroin to babies in public parks? And he goes, that is horrible. Public parks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.